Ladies and gentlemen, it's 8 p.m. Beijing time right now.、Uh, we are going to start our lecture right now. 大家晚上好 Good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, we are going to start our first、uh, lecture of、um, Chinese culture.、Um, so today our topic is about China's modern transportation and.、Uh, Uh, the lecture will be in total about one and a half hours. You can leave your message if you have any questions、uh, about the topic today or anything you want to discuss with us about the topic.、Uh, we will have about twenty minutes question and answer part by the end of the lecture. So, firstly,、uh, please allow me to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Professor Liu Xin,、uh, Miss Liu, <laughs> yeah, Miss Liu is here, and Miss Miss Liu is an、uh, associate professor and master supervisor.、Uh, she got her doctoral degree from China University of Communication, majoring in linguistics and applied linguistics. Her focus is in research and teaching of English and intercultural communication. And she published three books, including British Social and Cultural Study, and Let's Talk About Beijing. Today,、uh, we are honored to have Professor Liu here to introduce us China's modern transportation. So let's welcome Professor Liu to start. Okay, thank you very much, Angela. And、uh, nice to see all of you guys here.、Uh, my name is Liu Xin.、Uh, Xin is my、uh, Liu is my surname, right? Xin is my given name. I'm so glad and so happy to be here、uh, to have this chance to talk about Beijing and talk about China's modern transportation together with you.、Um, uh, I noticed that some of you said,、uh, "Well, because this is the evening, right?、Uh, in Beijing now, eight o'clock, right?" And I noticed that you are. From different parts of the world, right? And I,、uh, many of you have、uh, typed in the chat box saying that you're from like Thailand, right? From Singapore or Cambodia.、Um, well, so I'm so happy, right, to see all of you here.、Um, and also, I noticed that since、uh, you have、uh, signed for this lecture, you must be quite interested in this topic. And so, it's really an honor for me to share my experience and also、uh, what I've witnessed, right, about the modern the development. Of China's modern transportation. Okay, so now、uh, you know that just now Angela have introduced、uh, has introduced that、uh, this lecture will last for one hour or、uh, maybe one hour and a half, right? So if you have any questions, so feel free, right? Don't hesitate to type in the.、Uh, Uh, chat box, right?、Uh, we can see this uh, your uh, uh, questions, and we will answer the question, right? And we also have、uh, like half an hour、uh, to communicate later after the lecture. Okay, so now let's start.、Um, Well, as you can see, the topic, right? China's modern transportation. I just want to ask you,、um, say, when you talk, when you think about this topic, what will come up to your mind? Is there anything quite impressive? Right about China's modern transportation. Or what do you know about China's modern transportation? Anything about it? You can type in the chat box if you know anything. Maybe like, 高铁 yes. <laughs> This is just like a name card of uh, uh, China's modern transportation, right? High speed rail, right? That's the top one of the topics of today. Great, yeah. I noticed that many of you have written down such a great answer here, right? Bulletin train, right? Or maybe have you ever、uh, ever heard of、uh, Da Xing、uh, International Airport, right? So. Well, in fact, today we are going to cover many of those, yeah, different modes of transportation. Yes, so today we are going to cover like the two major topics. So one is the intra-city transportation, the other is the inter-city transport. So in the intra-city transport,、uh, we will talk about like the bus or subway, taxi. Uh, share bikes and private cars and cycling and walking and in intercity transport.、Uh, We're going to talk about the airplane, right? And just now you've mentioned, right, the railway, or we say the high speed train, high speed rail, right? And we will also say a few words about intercity bus, and then we will have the Q and A part. Okay, so now let's first come to the intercity transport.、Um, 
So that is the transportation right within the city. So I will just uh, focus on the situation here in Beijing. And we'll also say a few words about some other cities in Beijing too. But before we come to the details, I have this question for you. How do you commute? And what is your favorite way for intercity travel? So you have to travel from your commute from your home to your workplace, right? So how do you do that? How do you commute? So you can, um, well, while you're thinking about this question, I would like to show you a video, right? Uh, took by myself, right? Uh, I can show you about how I commute by subway right here in Beijing. Uh, now let's watch this video. So first I need to get the ticket. First to choose the line you want to take and then find the stop that you want to get off and choose the way of payment. I choose the way to pay by WeChat. And then I scan the QR code and pay for three yuan. After that, the ticket will come out. So the ticket is here. Okay, so this is the ticket, single journey ticket. Sometimes I also use the transportation smart card, tap and pay. The train is coming. There's the outer door. When it opens, then the inner door will also open and then you can get in. And then you can insert the card into the slot or tap your transportation smart card. Okay, so that is my way of commuting, right, uh, to my workplace by subway, right? I noticed some of you have typed in your answer in the chat box. Uh, Thomas, you said that you drive the car, right, to your workplace, right? So you go by, yeah, okay. And Peter, you said that mian bao chu na. So what, what does mian bao chu mean? Okay, bus for me in Luxembourg, right? So uh okay just kidding okay um so i think that most of you uh would take either subway right or bus or maybe you drive your private car right to go to your workplace right um so for me my favorite way uh, for intercity travel is just the subway because it is so fast it's so convenient and it is punctual right and you do not need to consider like the situation the water uh, weather condition right so it can ensure me that i can arrive uh, in my classroom on time right so that is about the commute right in beijing so we will start with the bus right and then we will talk about the subway and also the private cars, et cetera, in Beijing. So now let's look at this part here. There's a map um, here uh, in the left. Um, so it shows us about the routes, uh, bus routes, right, in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Nanjing. So these are big cities, right, in China. Well, let's focus on Beijing. You can see this is really a, um, a big cluster, right, of different routes. Um, and even in this, especially uh, in the center part of Beijing, this is really intensive, right? And also like the suburbs of Beijing or the outskirts of Beijing, you can still see the routes. So that's to say the bus can reach almost every part of Beijing, right? Not only the central part of it, but also like the greater Beijing, right? The outskirts of Beijing. Yeah, indeed, um, the bus in Beijing, I, I mean, the bus system, right, is most widely used and quite affordable so this is not expensive and it is open from one in the morning five in the morning right to 11 in the evening right and, and it has almost uh 1600 routes so that's why you can see such a huge map here right and uh, there are estimated that over thirty-two thousand buses and usually the buses, buses are identified by numbers or Chinese characters. Uh, for example, uh, if you see uh, the bus with the number of uh, like uh, six one uh, six um, six one one, right? So that means that's the uh, bus for the downtown regular lines, right? So just which, which is to say the bus just runs through the uh, center of Beijing, and then. 
say if it is a, um, a long distance bus, right? So it will just run through the outskirts, then it will be uh, started with eight or nine, right? And also there's the nine lines, but usually the nine lines starts with a small number like a one, two, 38. Well, this is about some simple facts uh, about Beijing bus. Now, let me show you some of those pictures of the buses in Beijing. Um, so there are some regular ones, right? Not that big or not quite small. And uh, there are huge ones, actually. You can see this one is so big, right? With four doors, right? And uh, this one is really beautiful with a beautiful color. And there's even a double-decker uh, bus. Uh, I still remember the double-decker bus probably appeared in Beijing like, uh, 20 years ago, right? Uh, well, so um, I still remember when they first appeared, I was so uh, excited about it, right? And then I would like to climb up to the uh, upper decker and sit to the front and enjoy the view, right, while traveling. Uh, so that is about the different buses in Beijing. Well, previously, you know, um, in the old days, I still remember when I was quite young, like 30 years ago, um, when I was traveling by bus in Beijing, it was quite crowded. Um, there was no air conditioning and it was quite cold in the winter and quite hot in summer, especially when it is very crowded. And usually there's a conductor and the conductor will, you know, just collect the, uh, will sell the tickets, right? Especially when the car is, uh, the bus is moving and the conductor has to squeeze the way through the crowds, right? To, to ensure that everybody can get a ticket. And especially you have to pay cash and uh, if there's no, uh, you know, correct change for it, that will be really troublesome. Um, so that is the situation uh, in like 30 years ago. However, now it is quite different. Now we say the bus in Beijing is so comfortable com and convenient. So first it is air conditioned and also with special seats. You can see here, these are two red seats, right? Um, they are reserved for the, um, disabled or say the pregnant women or the kids or even the uh, senior citizens, right? And so it is warm in the winter and uh, quite cool um, uh, with beautiful temperature, right? Nice temperature in, in, in summer. And also there are updated information uh, for the coming of the bus. For example, if you wait in line um, at the bus stop, you can see on the board, right, about the information, uh, what a bus will come and in what minute, in how many minutes, right, and you can also check in your apps, right, you can see clearly about when the bus will come in, so you don't need to be worried or anxious about the waiting, right, and also about the payment, just now mentioned the conductor, previously conductor was really, um, well, they really had a hard time, right, uh, selling the tickets. However, now there's no conductor at all um, in any of those buses in China, in, in Beijing. Well, usually people will just pay um, by self-help, right? You can see there's a reading machine. So you can use, just now mentioned that uh, transportation card. Uh, so you can just, uh, uh, you can tap um, and just get it closer to the reading machine. And then uh, when you get home, you just tap it. Right, and then when you get up, you tap again, and then the money will be deducted uh, from the card because the card is prepaid, uh, um, and the money can be just deducted. Right, the ticket is the ticket fee is deducted from the card, um, and also you can use the uh, cell phone right with the app. Right, so the app uh, can show a kind of QR code. Uh, so there's a place to scan the QR code. And again, so when you get on, you scan it. And then when you get up, you scan it again. And this time, uh, the money is again deducted, uh, which because your app is somewhat related or uh, linked with your WeChat pay. So the money is deducted in this way. So it's quite convenient, right? Um, and also, you can see I've told you that it is quite affordable. Uh, it's not expensive at all. Uh, so the price, obviously the bus fare is charged by distance. So the minimum fee is two yuan for the first 10 kilometers, right? That's six miles, right? And then if you have a long, longer journey, right? So they will charge like an extra one yuan for every additional five kilometers. But say people want, like to use the apps or the card just because uh, you can get a 50% discount. So that is say you can use one yuan, right, to travel, uh, to take the bus for 10 kilometers, 
right? So isn't it a bargain, right? And most importantly, it is also free for some people, like for children below 1.3 meter, right? Or for um, senior citizens who are uh, 60 years old. Um, so this is really nice, right? For people to travel by bus, uh, very comfortable, convenient, and it's really a bargain. It's not that expensive. All right, okay. So there are also some special uh, features about the Beijing city bus. Uh, you can see here, there's a special bus lane uh, so this is a uh, specially uh, designed for or specially used for the bus. Some bus lanes can be used by the buses uh, for 24 hours, right? So you are not allowed right, to drive your uh, private car there. And some lanes uh, will uh, forbid cars, private cars, uh, uh, between the rush hours, right? In the rush hours, for example, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning or 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, in the evening. Uh, well, if you drive your car there, then you will be fine. <laughs> so that is a special way to e uh, improve the efficiency of the uh, uh, bus, right? And also it's a way to encourage people to take the low carbon uh, way of transportation, right? So that's why most of the people uh, prefer to take the bus because it's really fast and convenient. And also there's uh, uh, ecologically buses here in Beijing. So for most of those buses here, uh, like 65% of it uh, is driven by new energy and almost 30% is driven by gas. I still remember like 30 years ago, the buses were uh, driven by, um, I still remember it was just, uh, driven by, uh, Diesel, right? So it was quite noisy, right? Not that much clean. And uh, now it is totally different, right? So the bus is quite clean and quite quiet, right? Um, and also, um, um, I think that people really like the travel uh, in the bus. Uh, there are some other special buses, like the sightseeing bus, this one, right? So there are several lines to take you to, like, to the Forbidden City or to Tianmen or to Tsinghua University or uh, Summer Palace, right? Um, well, you just need to pay like a 20 yuan, right, for the trip. Um, and also there are uh, people will just introduce to you about the uh, the tourist attractions along the line. And also there are customized bus. Uh, customized bus means that if you have, say you are a group of people, right? You have some special needs, like I, you, you need to come to a certain place and you can just use the app, right? Like Beijing bus, right? The app to order a bus, just like the order or, or to call a taxi, right? Then you can, uh, a bus will come, right? To help you to commute to a certain place that you have um, assigned. Uh, so that is about the Beijing city bus. We have talked about the features and the special, some, some of those special uh, features of a city bus in Beijing. Now let's come to the subway, right? So just now I will show you uh, the subway, right? Uh, I, I usually use, right, to commute to, to my university, right? And uh, look at this map. Uh, this is about Beijing subway. Uh, you can see really huge network, right? Uh, so there are two ring lines. You can see here, the ring lines, right? This is called line two, and this is line 10. And actually this one um, is just centered around, um, built just around the old Beijing. And this one is just like uh, around the greater Beijing, right? And there are also uh, uh, horizontal lines, like these two lines, right? And there are also like these kind of uh, uh, vertical lines, right? So you can see these two lines here. Um, this one called line one, this one is very old. It is the first subway, right? Uh, not only in Beijing, but also in China, because Beijing was the first city in China to operate a subway uh, with its first line operating in 1971. And it is still used today, right? And also very, uh, almost the busiest line, because you can see that almost every line uh, connect is connected, right, with the line one. So this is really like the uh, um, major, uh, line here in Beijing, I mean the subway. Um, and also there are some other, uh, well, you can see this one, this line is a, a parallel line, right, of the 
uh, line one, and there are some vertical ones. And also there are altogether 23 subway lines in operation, including two airport express lines. One is to uh, 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 Capital uh, Airport, right? And the other is to Daxing Airport. And also two tram lines, right? Two tram lines uh, for some, uh, you know, because some people would like to uh, live in, uh, like the uh, outskirts of Beijing, and then uh, they can commute, right, by taking the trap lines to the center of Beijing to work, right? So that is about um, the map of Beijing subway. So it is really the fastest transportation in downtown, a good way to avoid traffic jams. For example, um, you know, I, I just got my PhD degree in uh, CUC, that's China University of Communication. Uh, well, that university is quite far away from the center of Beijing. It is just here, almost uh, uh, to the uh, most eastern part of Beijing. However, I lived here, almost the west part of Beijing. So I need to travel, uh, just across, uh, just use the line one, uh, travel to the university. Um, so usually I will just take this line. And uh, it is really, um, uh, uh, convenient because I can only use like uh, six yuan, right, and finish this journey. However, if I call a taxi or if I, uh, I would, it will just uh, cost like, um, it will take almost uh, uh, one hour. Well, at the same time, cost me like a uh, sixty yuan. So I think that the subway indeed uh, is a quite uh, comfortable and also convenient way of transportation. And also because, you know, we love subway just also because you do, there are really great facilities, right, uh, in here in the subway of Beijing. Um, so this is the logo of uh, Beijing subway. So at anywhere, if you see this blue sign with the letter D inside a circle on it, you know that the subway is just there, right? It's close to you. So usually there's the uh, gate uh, or the entrance of the uh, subway station. Um, and also there are some uh, amenities like the nursery, right, the toilets, right, are on the platform level or in the ticket hall of each stop. And also there are carriages of different temperature. Uh, for example, you can see here, it will, uh, this, um, yeah, this uh, signal, right, to just tell you about uh, if you want to go to the very cool uh, carriage, right, uh, say if in the, that's the, in this hot summer, right, so then you can go to what kind of uh, carriages. And if you prefer a moderate one, then you can like go to a carriage one, two, three, et cetera, right? So that really cater to different needs of people, right? There are also special seats here. Um, you can see this seats usually is reserved for like the disabled people or like the pregnant women or the um, uh, elder, elders people, right? The senior citizens, et cetera. So I think that's a really um, good way, right, for people to travel uh, in the subway. Um, well, just now I'll show you, right, from the video, how to take the subway in Beijing um, and how to pay, right? So um, usually you can use the transportation smart card. It is prepaid um, and then you um, tap, tap it, right, uh, when you enter the sub, uh, subway station. And then when you leave, you can also tap again, and then the money is deducted. And also you can use the app uh, with a, a QR code there. Um, it's similar to the bus uh, bus ride, right? And the ticket can also bought, right, at the customer service center or self-service ticket. Uh, just now, uh, like I've shown you in the video, right, if you want to buy the single journey ticket here, right? Yeah, you can use this uh, vending machine um, and uh, you can just uh, use cash or pay by WeChat or Alipay or, um, yeah, so that's ways for you to pay and then you can get the ticket by yourself. Um, so that is about uh, the way of payment. And the subway, subway fare uh, is listed here. It is uh, based on the distance. Um, so the first six kilometers, you will be charged the three yuan. And so I think that it can cover most of the journey actually, right? And then if your journey is longer and that's exceed six kilometers to, uh, but within 30 kilometers, then uh, so one yuan will be added for each further six kilometers. And so for example, like uh, what I said, I went to the University of uh, China's University of uh, Communication. Well, that's almost 30 
kilometers away from my home. Um, so if I take the uh, subway, so I can only need to pay six or seven yuan, that's okay. Um, but if it is really a longer journey, it exceeds 30 kilometers, then uh, it won't be that you know, terrible, right, the, the fare. So only one yuan for each further 20 kilometers. So you can see, um, so um, for most people for downtown traveling, uh, actually they can just use like a three to six yuan. That's almost uh, can cover uh, many parts of uh, downtown Beijing, right? So that is about the subway fare. Mm. Okay, so um, I, I think that, some of those uh, subway stations uh, have become um, the hottest uh, tourist attractions already. Uh, some people really like um, the uh, decorations and also the paintings of some of those subway stations. Uh, I've listed some of those pictures for you to take a look. For example, this one, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the paintings right on the wall of uh, Dongsi subway station. So Dongsi is quite close to Tiananmen Square. It is really, really the old uh, center of Beijing, right? So you can see um, the structure, right, of this building. And also uh, the picture, right, shows to us about uh, the Chinese traditional way of celebrating uh, uh, Chinese New Year, right? Like a uh, light of the uh, fireworks, right? And I guess these are the uh, Tang Hu Lu, right? A uh, candid hawthorns. And so that is about uh, in Dongsi. And this is in New Jie. Uh, New Jie actually is a special cluster for um, for Hui people, right? We know that there are um, many um, peoples right here in Beijing. I mean, especially the minorities. So you can see in on the wall, right? There's decorations or paintings about the how the celebrations of uh, maybe different minority peoples here in Beijing, in here in China, and here this is about um, the zoo, Beijing Zoo, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know whether you can see clearly because the, actually the paintings about the animals. Um, so you can imagine if you step out of the train and you see this picture, right? Like many of those animals are coming to welcome you to, to come to the zoo, right? So you know you're in the mood, right? Of uh, of uh, coming to the zoo and have a great time there, right? To, to be with the animals. And this picture is uh, uh, is the. Uh, subway station in Xinfadi because Xinfadi is a um, very large uh, vegetable and fruits uh, market market right and especially for whole, wholesale business um, so you can see that's why there's the watermelon right and also some other fruits right and this is actually a door right it's directly into the watermelon so when you come here uh, when you step out of the train, you know that you are in a, you are coming to a market, right, for fruit and uh, vegetable. And now let's look at some other examples. Uh, very beautiful stations, right, um, with really aesthetic beauty. Uh, like this one is Olympic Park Station, right, so like these decorations. Um, and also like uh, this one. Um, this is uh, the station about the National Library. Uh, so you can see there's a, just like a seal with the Chinese character Shu, right, book, right? Um, it shows to you that it's the place for you to read, for you to read, right? Uh, for you to find books to read. And also I've shown you some of those pictures, like this one is also very beautiful. Uh, like many lanterns, right? Lit up, uh, borrow your head, right? So this very beautiful stations. and. Let me show you a video. Uh, this video is uh, taken in Nanluo Guxiang. I don't know whether you have heard of this place. That's the famous Hutong, uh, right, in Beijing. Um, you can see from this picture, uh, it seemed that to show us about the childhood memory, right? But there are some interesting things about it. Now let's watch it. This is Nanluo Guxiang Station, which is the famous Hutong in Beijing. You can see these shiny little cubes, and inside these cubes, there are interesting things like a mask, like the pin, or marble, or even checker, and some old card, which bears old memories. Mm. Okay, so you can see, this is a, also, I think that's a really smart way, right, for people to uh, keep this 
secret or maybe the memory of the past, right? In this way, uh, it seemed that when you come to this place, um, you can, when you see all these things stored in those little cubes, it seemed that memory and the, the previous years are still kept there, right? And so that's about uh, Beijing subway stations. Right. Um, so some people will really just come to this place to take pictures because they really like the way they um, closely. I mean, the features of each station um, are closely matched with the uh, destination, with the place just uh, uh, close to the station. OK, so now let's come to the next topic about Beijing taxi. Uh, I think that for uh, most people, when you come to Beijing, probably the first thing, first vehicle you're going to take probably is the taxi, right? So actually, there are many cabs or many taxis in Beijing. Uh, that's almost uh, 66,000, right? More than 66,000 uh, cabs or taxi here in Beijing. So it is, um, the operation hour is just day and night. So that is say you can get a taxi uh, during the day and also at night you can also uh, get a taxi. So it is really no problem for you for your travel. And although sometimes maybe it's, it's a bit hard to get during rush hours or in bad weather and only four adult passengers are allowed to sit in one uh, taxi car. Okay, um, so how to pay a tax? Well, I just want to tell you a very interesting story. Um, um, you know, one of my relatives, right, who just lived in America for many years, and recently he came back to Beijing. And he, he, he just complained that saying that, wow, I cannot hail a taxi, I cannot get a taxi uh, by waving my hand anymore. Now, why? The, why they are just ignore me? And I I told you, I told him that actually because now people in Beijing, they all use this kind of online car hailing app. And although previously people can do that, like a hail attacks by hand signal, but probably you can also use it. Uh, however, the result is few taxi will stop for you because probably they are um, going to, you know, just uh, to pick up the, the, the one who had made the order uh, on, online, right, with him. Uh, so people usually just use online car hailing apps uh, to call a taxi. Although there are also some other ways, for example, there's a taxi dispatch number. Uh, so you can call this number to get a taxi. But for most people, they would just use this car hailing app to um, to hail a tax, right? Um, for example, there are many such apps like a DD, right? You can see it doesn't sound like the sound of uh, the, the car, right? And also Shouqi or maybe Gaode, right? So there are many such apps for you or quite Right, it's for you to uh, call a taxi. And uh, it's very uh, easy, right, for you to use this app. Uh, like you can enter the place that you want to go, and then the app will uh, and also show to, uh, and also just um, make, uh, make clear, right, so where you want to get on the, the, the taxi, right? And then the app will um, like help you uh, to search. Uh, what taxis are around you, and then usually one taxi uh, will respond, and then uh, he will just come in maybe in one minute or two minutes, right? You can see clearly about where the taxi is and in how many minutes that the taxi will come, right? And also if uh, there's also telephone telephone number for you to um, contact the driver, right? And then uh, you can, when you finish the journey, you can pay either by cash or by WeChat Pay or Alipay. But you should take notice that um, credit card or debit cards are, cannot work. Uh, but you can just link your credit card with WeChat Pay or Alipay. Then you can pay um, the driver, right, when you finish the journey. So that's most of the uh, cases, right, for using the taxi here in Beijing. Um, and for the taxi fire, um, the black down rate is 13 yuan. Right for the first three kilometers, that's almost two mile, two miles, and then um, you will need to add two point three uh, yuan for each kilo uh, kilometers, right? Over um, if it is over three kilometers, right? In the daytime, so that is to say, uh, during the night, right? It will be uh, more expensive, right? That would be uh, the the price will be different, right? So that will be two point seventy six uh, yuan for each kilometer added. 
right? So that's about the taxi fire fair. Okay. Uh, so if you have any question, you can um, ask me or even uh, type in the uh, chat box. Okay. So that is about the taxi price and how to hail tax. Hmm. Um, okay. So now let's come to the next topic that is about share bikes. I don't know whether you have heard of the shared bikes. Um, so what does shared bikes mean? Okay, let me, um, let me, like, let's just imagine the situation, right? Say if you take the subway or if you take the bus, however, usually when you get off, right, the bus stop or the subway station is still somewhat, um, uh, for example, maybe one kilometers away from your home or your apartment or your house. So how to deal with this one last uh, last one uh, kilometer, right? So I think that uh, usually, you know, in uh, in the old days, right, in Beijing, um, some people will just uh, leave uh, their own bicycle, right, close to the subway station uh, or to the bus stop. Uh, however, sometimes the bikes would be stolen, right? Or some sometimes people also take some so-called mini cab. Well, however, these mini cabs are uh, really noisy and it's really a big headache because really um, um, just uh, go here and there and it's really a great headache for the public transportation system. So finally, I think that there was a th this was really a great smart creation of Chinese people. Um, there comes the share bikes. Well, the share bikes, I remember, uh, maybe came to Beijing or came to China in 2016, right? Um, in 2016. And then the bike was called Mobike. This is the first one. And it was so new that people really don't know how to use it, right? And uh, however, after years of development, it is really such a great um, business and also such a great um, convenience right for people um, so how to use a shared bike in Beijing so you need to you can see that usually there are lines of such share bikes uh, close to the station right uh, like I mean subway station or maybe bus stop right so then you can download uh, the app uh, and uh, in your uh, in your cell phone and then you can sign up uh, you don't need to pay any deposit and then you um, choose one bike, right? You like, right? And then scan the QR code to because there's a QR code here, which is um, a way for you to unlock the bike. Uh, it is locked, pre-locked, right? And then you can unlock the bike and then start your riding. And when you finish riding, when you arrived at your home, and then you can um, dock the car, uh, dock the bike, right? Um, or put the bike, leave the bike in the right place, and then lock the bike. And then you can pay online for the journey, right? For this trip. Well, I can show you a video, um, which is quite uh, clear for you to see uh, how to use this shared bike. I am planning to ride a yellow Meituan bike. I start my Meituan app, click the scan button to scan the QR code on the back. You will hear the back unlocking beep, and it also shows successful unlocking on the app. Take a look again. Scan. And it's unlocked. When I finish my writing, I just need to find a nearest parking spot according to the map of the app. Then lock the back, and the app will automatically charge you from the card for WeChat. It charged me 1.5 yuan from my WeChat pay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is about a, a video about how to use the share bikes. Um, it is not that expensive to use this bike. Uh, there are different types of uh, bikes, right? You can see from the color, right? Like Didi bike, Hello bike, or Meituan bike. Uh, usually they will charge you uh, like uh, uh, 1.5 yuan for first 15 minutes. And if you continue to ride, right, you continue to uh, ride, and then uh, we will charge you like uh, another 1.5 yuan uh, for every extra 30 minutes, right? But don't forget that you sh shouldn't just leave the uh, bike about uh, somewhere, right? You need to uh, leave it to or park it in the right place, 
right? Otherwise, there will be a penalty, right? There will be a fine for you. Um, so that's quite convenient, at, uh, especially for those commuter. Um, so they do not need to buy their own bicycle anymore, right? Uh, and also, uh, you know that some people are like this bike very much, and they will use this bike not only just for commuting, um, but also for like uh, take a spring outing, right? Or just uh, ride the bicycle and uh, uh, just try to keep fit, right? To, to do some exercises, right? To enjoy the beautiful sceneries along the road, right? So that's the uh, another usage, right? Of the shared bikes. And that's why that few people tend to buy bikes anymore because, you know, you need a place to, um, to you know, just it really occupies large, uh, place right in your home and also you should uh, try to uh, you know just maintain right uh, maintain this uh, uh, a bike right however uh, with this one that you can take where, um, the bike that uh, whenever you find one and just uh, park it whenever you want right so it's really convenient okay so that is to uh, that is about the shared bikes and uh, now let's talk about the private cars just now we noticed that some of you will commute by using private cars uh, but here uh, in in Beijing I mean because uh, Beijing is such a uh, large city with so many people like uh, 20 million people right so um, it is not possible right for every person right uh, to have a private car uh, so the policy here is just to restrict right um, so try to um, uh, maintain that this is as less um, cars as possible, right, to, to come to the road. Uh, so each resident can only register one passenger car in the city. And also there's some uh, restrictions, uh, for example, like uh, the uh, license, right? I mean, the plate, right? Uh, the plate is issued by lottery policy. Uh, so that you say you need to win lottery to get the plate. Um, so that is to say, it's not based on your need. Um, so it's based on your luck, right? So some of those plates are in blue and some are in green. And if it is it is in green, so that is the um, a special plate for the new energy uh, uh, vehicles, uh, new energy cars. So um, there's a kind of a, a policy that is really, uh, it's easier, right, for, for the uh, new energy vehicle users, right? So um, if you want to get a plate, uh, you do not need to use the lottery policy, uh, but you also have to wait. Uh, there's a very long line actually, because so many people uh, wanted to get the plate as soon as possible, right? So there's a long waiting list. Um, but anyway, there's a date, right, for you to get it, but for the lottery, uh, I mean, for the internal combustion car, well, it's really purely on luck, right? Uh, you should rely on your luck, whether or not you can be chosen uh, to win the chance to get the plate, right? So that's the way to restrict, right, the usage of a car uh, in the city. Um, and because more and more people are using the new energy uh, vehicle, right, so there's uh, a great development of the uh, charging and battery swap network. Now it covers the whole city and can cater to 2 million new energy vehicles. Um, so it is really a great uh, progress or uh, development, right, for the facilities of those um, charging network, right, just for those uh, new, uh, new energy vehicle users. And also there are restrictions on private vehicles uh, based on the last digit of the license plates from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on workdays within the fifth rain road. So how do I understand this? For example, I, I have my private car, right? And the last digit of my car is six. So for July, August, and September, I am not allowed to drive on Thursday. Right. So, but uh, um, but if that is before seven or after eight p.m., I can also uh, use my car. Uh, but however, during this, like just like the work hour, right? So you cannot use your car. Otherwise, if you are noticed, you will be fined. And uh, so, in the next season, like from uh, um, October, oh, sorry, um, yeah, October, uh, uh, um, 
till December, right? November and December, uh, I couldn't use my car on Friday. Uh, so that's just this kind of, well, they will switch, right? About the restriction, uh, about the which day, on which day, right? So what kind of uh, uh, last digit uh, could not be used, right? The car could not be used on the road. So that is about the uh, restrictions. Um, so I think that is a way uh, to uh, keep the transportation uh, more convenient, uh, more uh, efficient, right? And also, um, I think that's highly environmentally conscious. Um, that's why we can get uh, clear sky, right? And also clean air, right, in Beijing. Okay, so that is about private cars. Um, okay, um, just now to mention that some people like the share bikes so much, and they would just use it as a way for them to commute, right? Uh, say if your working place is not that far away from your house, from your apartment. So some people will just use uh, the share bikes uh, to commute to their workplace. Uh, so they will use cycling, right? And some of buy, will buy their own bike, right? To ride to their uh, workplace. And because this is a chance for them to do some exercises, right? And it's also a good way for them to keep fit, right? Keep healthy. And some people prefer walking, right? To um, the workplace, and it's also a good way, right? I mean, that's really a low carbon uh, way of living. Um, and also at the same time that you help you to keep fit, right? So I think that's all for uh, the intra-city traveling or intra-city transport. Uh, we have talked about like the cycling, walking, right? Uh, bus, uh, subway, and also share bikes and private cars in Beijing. I guess probably you have got a somewhat idea right about the intra-city transportation in Beijing and China. Okay, now let's come to the next part that is intercity transport. Uh, intercity transport. Okay, so I have a question for you. So if you want to travel to other city, how do you get to other city? By train or plane? And which way do you prefer? You can type in the chat box and let me know. By train, uh, go here. Okay, plane. By plane. Oh, bus. Oh, bus. Okay. By train. Oh, okay. I noticed that most of you um, give me this answer by train, right? Or yeah, high speed train. Okay. Now let me give you a case analysis here. Suppose um, I have a business trip, right, from Beijing to Shanghai. Uh, I have listed many choices for you to choose. Uh, for example, uh, just now some of you have mentioned about the high-speed train, right? Here in China, uh, if you take this train from Beijing to Shanghai, it will last for about four to six hours, and it will cost like 500 or six, 600 yuan. But there are lots of choices, right? So almost every 15 minutes, there's a train <laughs> to take you to be from Beijing to Shanghai. And however, you need to consider the time that's spent for you to uh, to go to the um, a railway station, right? Probably it will also take you another one hour. So altogether, total time spent would be five to seven hours. And it is really comfortable. Later, I'm going to tell you the details about the uh, Gautier, right? Uh, High-speed rail in Beijing, uh, in China. Right, and also it is really punctual, right? Uh, it will ensure that you can arrive on time. And there's another good way um, for you to choose from Beijing to Shanghai or even from Shanghai to Beijing, that is the overnight sleeper train. Um, so it will usually start uh, in the evening, like a seven or eight, uh, and then arrive the next morning, right? Um, so that is a, when you, you, you have a good sleep, a sound sleep in the sleeper, and then, when you wake up, you are in another city, right? In Shanghai or in Beijing, right? So it uh, lasts for about 12 to 40 hours and they cost from 300 to 500 yuan. And, uh, but there are not that many choices actually, only four trains um, uh, yearly, right? And the total time span, because you also need to add the time that you come, uh, you go to the uh, railway station, that's almost 13 to 14 hours. And it's also comfortable because there's like the hard sleeper or the soft sleeper, right? You can choose and uh, really comfortable. People can have a good sound sleep there. And then next day, right? You arrive at the place and then it also save the money 
for the hotel, right? Um, so that's many of uh, many people's choice uh, to have to take this this train, right? Um, it's a cheaper, right? And also um, also save the money of uh, spend the night in the hotel. And also some people will choose airplane, right? Uh, well, definitely. Uh, it is uh, a shorter journey, right? You only need to use two or three hours, right, to arrive in Shanghai, but definitely it is more expensive, right? 1,000 or two, two, 2,000 yuan. And also there are many planes, right? Many flights uh, from Beijing to Shanghai, like every 30 minutes, there will be a flight. And, uh, but remember the total time spent because usually the airports are far away from the center part of downtown Beijing. So you need to use like, uh, uh, two hours maybe, or at least one hour and a half, right, to go to the airports. Uh, and so you need to add all these hours into your um, your consideration, right? So four hours maybe all together. And then definitely it's comfortable and really fast. However, airplane is, uh, is subjected to the uh, change of the weather, right? So it is really affected by the weather. If the weather is, is not that good, right? So then probably the airplane will be canceled or delayed, right? And also there's the intercity bus. Just now I've noticed some of you mentioned the bus, right? Here there are also some buses, right, in operation uh, to um, provide you this uh, this trip to Beijing, uh, from Beijing to Shanghai. Uh, but it takes 26 hours, right? And you need to sleep uh, again, right? In the sleeper because accommodation really provided in the bus. So you need to sleep in the bus, right? It's cheaper, right? Only uh, almost 300 yuan, right? Um, and uh, there are not so many choices. Uh, usually there are three uh, buses, right? Each day, uh, usually start, um, started uh, in some of the long distance bus station here in Beijing. And also you need to, go to this station, right? So you need to spend like one hour to go there. Like altogether, probably you need to uh, spend 27 hours to finish this journey, right? And also if the uh, condition, right, weather condition is bad, probably the bus will also be canceled, right? So this is a, a case analysis about the different ways of traveling from Beijing to Shanghai or Shanghai to Beijing. So which one do you think is the best one? Right, I think that really depends on the time on your hands, right, and also about the money, right, the, your budget, right, uh, and also probably it depends on uh, your special uh, needs. For example, I really want to uh, enjoy um, the scenery because some take the high speed train, um, they have the chance to um, to uh, take a look at the uh, the scenery alongside the uh, the route, right. Um, so. Uh, it depends on you, right? Um, but I can see you can see that there are really lots of choices. Now let's focus on the plane first, okay? Um, so there are really lots of airports in Beijing, in China, more than two hundred airports that can serve both international and domestic destinations. Uh, there are also some other airports that can only serve uh, uh, domestic uh, travels, uh, but there are. 200 airports that can take uh, that can serve both international and the national uh, destinations and they are ma ma mainly governed by the civil aviation administration of china and it is said that uh probably like in 10 days uh yeah sorry in 10 years right uh we will have uh, maybe 400 civilian transport airports uh, so um, that is say really there is a really huge um well development right for um, the uh, construction of the airports. Now let's try to know some of those famous or uh, important major airports in China. In Beijing, there are two very important ones, uh, Beijing Capital International Airport, right, and also Beijing Daxing International Airport. And in Shanghai, there are also two. One is Pudong International Airport and the other is uh, uh, Hongqiao International Airport. And uh, Mm, there's the uh, Guangzhou Baiyun International Airport in Guangzhou, right, in Guangdong, and also uh, Chengdu, right, so Chengdu uh, Shuangliu International Airport. This is a really a major uh, airport uh, in southwest of China. Um, and also in Yunnan province, Kunming, right, Kunming Changshui International Airport. Well, there's also like in Hong Kong, right, uh, International Airport, and uh, mm, like uh, 
uh, Hangzhou, right, uh, Xiaoshan International Airport. Well, these are really major airports in China. Uh, if you want to uh, go to like southern China or northern China or even southwest of China, usually you will land uh, in these airports. Well, let's take Daxing International Airport as example. Um, well, let's look at this picture. This is like a bird eye view of this great international airport. It is really newly built, right? And what does this picture remind you of? What do you think this international airport look like? What does this picture remind you? Xing, okay, starfish. That's a great answer. Indeed, it has a nickname. It's just called starfish, right? Starfish. This is the outer appearance of this um, starfish um, uh, international air, uh, airport. Uh, so inside this airport, you can see this beautiful inside decorations, right? Um, this is like a, a C column, right? Uh, shaped like a C, not the direct column here. Um, so it really creates a beautiful line of sight. Um, and now let me give you some of those fine facts uh, about the Beijing Daxing International Airport. First, you should know that it really occupies a large area. It occupies like uh, 700,000 square meters. Um, that is to say, it is almost the same size of the 89 football fields. So it is currently the world's largest single structure airport terminal. And it is designed, right? Or yeah, you know, this famous uh, Iraqi British architect, right? Uh, Zaha Hadid, right? Um, who also designed the aquatic center for the London 2012 uh, Olympics, uh, who was a great uh, ar architect, right? So this is also one of her masterpieces, right? That's that's in International Airport, and uh, a, it is really costly, right, to build this airport. Um, this airport cost 11 billion U.S. dollars, uh, and the construction took over uh, five years, um, and it is not that close to the downtown area of Beijing. Uh, it is almost 46 kilometers from Tiananmen Square. Um, although it is far away from um, the center of Beijing, there are many uh, easy transportations, right, uh, for people to get to the uh, in, uh, international airport. For example, there's expressway, right, and also uh, like the uh, subway, right, for you to take uh, to go to the airport. So um, it's not a trouble at all. Um, now there are many airlines uh, uh, moving to this airport, and it is said that the Beijing Daxing Airport will be cap uh, is capable of handling 100 million people by 2040, and which will overtake Atlanta International Airport. And so it is expected to eventually become the busiest airport in the world. And the design is also quite special. Uh, for example, just now I've told you that there's, uh, it is a column free design. There's no um, the uh, kind of traditional column inside this uh, airport. So the terminal structure is supported by eight C-shaped columns. So this design provides a direct and clear line of sight to where you need to go. And also it is, uh, it is a distance of 600 meters from the center of the terminal to the farthest gate. So that is about a five minutes walk, uh, walking. So that is they, they just try to ensure the efficiency, right? You don't need to walk very long distance, right, to go to the any gate. Um, so uh, almost all the gate, right, uh, with the center uh, of, uh, of this airport is within 600 meters. And altogether, there are four runways, uh, but it's said that it's supposed to be seven uh, in the future. Um, so the airport can handle 300 takeoffs and landings an hour. <laughs> so this is really a, a great, amazing um, international airport. So that's about uh, one of the examples right here about the airports in China. And when we talk about the airplanes, I should not forget this one, right? That is the first homemade aircraft or airplane in China. So it is called C or COMAC 919, right? It is the first self-developed narrow body jet in China. It is comparable to the Airbus A320, 
and the Boeing B737. And it has 164 seats, right? And uh, the first uh, uh, customer is the China Easter Airlines. And they made it the first maiden um, uh, flight in 2017, uh, that's in May. And then a, it was uh, just uh, uh, given to uh, China Eastern Islands, and then it made its first successful commercial flight in this May, right, 2000, uh, this year, right. So now it has served uh, like a total of two, 250 hours. Um, so we are really looking forward to the great progress uh, made by the uh, aircraft uh, production. And I, we also hope that this um, uh, this aircraft, right, will uh, make more uh, miracles and, and uh, um, really benefit the traveling of people, right, across the world, right? Okay, so that is about the uh, China-made, China right, or homemade airplane in China. Okay, I think that's all for the planes. Now, let's come to the high-speed rail in China, right? That's what you are really interested in and you're most familiar with, right? Um, Gao Tie, right? Or um, in here, in, in here, here we say uh, it is the world's largest high-speed rail network, uh, the world's largest one, and also most extensively used. Um, by saying this, we mean um, it really goes through like 30 out of the 33 provinces of China. So that is to say, if you take the high-speed rail, you can go to almost every part of China. Um, every part of China. Um, is somewhat connected with the uh, high-speed rail. So the total length of it is 20, uh, 270,000, oh, sorry, uh, 27,000 kilometers, right? Um, that accounts for two-thirds of the world's high-speed rail network. So that is a two-thirds of the world's high-speed rail network is in here in China. It's built up by the Chinese. And most importantly, it just keeps growing. Now, let me give you some of those uh, facts. First, there are several different types of rail. Uh, we call it the C class, G class, or D class. So the C class, uh, also uh, named as uh, HR, uh, it actually that should be um, uh, high speed rail, right? So the average speed is 226 kilometers per hour, right? Then the G class, G class actually is Gao Tie, you know, just to use the capital letter, right? Uh, for Gao Tie, right? Gao Tie, uh, well, the average speed for G class is uh, about 300 kilometers per hour. And there's also the D class. Um, D class stands for Dong uh, because Dong you know, D is the capital letter, uh, is the first letter, and it is capitalized here. Um, so D class, right? It runs either on high speed track or non high speed track. So it's somewhat slower than Gao Tie, but still it is, it belongs to the Chinese high speed rail system. So how fast is it? Just now mentioned like the Gao Tie, right? It uh, runs, um, so the speed is, uh, average speed is 300 kilometers per hour or a top speed of 350 kilometers per hour. And there's the uh, fast, fastest one, right? Uh, that's the Shanghai Maglev train. Uh, it can reach a massive 431 kilometers per hour. So that's really fast. Um, how do I understand this? Let me tell you some of those um, numbers. Uh, I remember like in the 1950s, uh, if, uh, if you uh, take the train from Beijing to Shanghai, then it will cost you like 36 hours. And in the 1990s, uh, it is reduced to 19 hours. However, now when you take Gao Tie, right, the G class of the Chinese high speed rail, it only costs four or five hours. So see the sharp contrast, right? And also, um, I've told you that this is really the world's fast, fastest right, uh, railway state, a uh, railway. And this is very convenient. It can reach almost all provinces of China. And it's also closer to the cities compared to the airplanes, right? Airports, right? Uh, airports, although it is fast, it's somewhat um, far away, right? From the uh, downtown uh, of the city. So you still need to travel from the airport to to the downtown area. Uh, however, for the high-speed rail, right, it is just close to the city and uh, it is really comfortable. It's quiet, it's smooth and with lots of space and lots of 
facilities. So for example, there's the electricity, right? And also you can order deliveries, right? Um, well, I think that's really, um, uh, and also it is smoking uh, forbidden uh, and it's also punctual. Um, I still remember uh, like uh, when I was young, right? Like 30 years ago, I took the train. Uh, I took the train to Chengde, right? Uh, I still remember when, then when I, I was a kid, right? With my mommy, I went to Chengde. And Chengde is the city in Hebei province. Um, I remember I, I, I took me eight hours, right? In the old train in China. And that train, there's only the green bench, uh, no such comfortable seat and also um you know the the, the windows open right and people are uh, shouting talking eating and smoking you know it's really you know a tiresome uh journey right i still remember when i step out of the train and when i get off the i got off the train i still felt the ground was swaying just because I, I used to, I, it took me eight hours, right, for the, for the ride. Uh, however, do you know how long does it take for me to take the Gautie, right, to go to Chengde? Now, 59 minutes, 59 minutes within one hour, then I can get to Chengde. And it is really comfortable, right, and also um, uh, really fast, right? Uh, so in 30 years of time, right, so totally different, the railway uh, system here in China. Okay, so you can see how this uh, uh, railway systems developed in China. Um, so from these columns, you can see that's in 2008. Uh, and then uh, like 2017, you can see this is a huge uh, development. And also this is a comparison, right, of with Chinese uh, the world, uh, Chinese high speed rail network with other countries. Uh, this is uh, the mileage, right, of uh, Chinese railway system. Um, this is, I guess, probably Spain or this is uh, Japan. And now let's look at this uh, map. Uh, that's in 2008. There are only, actually, only four. Uh, short lines right short lines and however now you can see in uh, 2017 uh, it can reach almost every part of china and there are also some uh um interesting facts right about um uh, the uh, railway station a uh, railway uh network or system in china um so there's the world's longest line that is from beijing all the way down to guangzhou Right, so this is the longest line, and also the world's fast, fastest line, line that is from Beijing to Shanghai. Beijing to Shanghai, and uh, if we say which is the world's first commercial magnetic levitation line, it should be Shanghai um, Maglev, right? Uh, so this line is the fastest. Uh, and so some of those facts. Now let me show you some remarkable railways built by the constructors here in China. Uh, one is the most beautiful route, uh, we call it the Hefei Fuzhou High Speed Line. Hefei is from Anhui province, uh, and the Fuzhou um, is also in almost in the um, southeastern part of China. And so this line is, is regarded as the most beautiful route because uh, it passes through two UNESCO World Heritage Sites one is the mountain Huangshan, Huangshan Mountain, right? The other is Wuyi Mountain. And so you know that it's so hard, right? If you want to pass through the mountain, right? You need to dig the tunnel, right? And let the train pass. So for most of the, um, the railways of this line um, actually are built upon the bridges or built through the tunnels. So altogether across this line, uh, there are 170 bridges and 54 tunnels. And like um, there's a, uh, the longest bridge they built uh, to, uh, to, to up, uphold the, uh, the, the, the railway. That is the 52 kilometer Tongling Yangtze River Ring Road. So that is 52 kilometers long. Can you imagine? We just first to build the bridge and then the railway, right? So it is the longest bridge on the route. And so it reduces the travel time between Hefei and Fuzhou to four hours, 
that previously people should use 14 hours to travel from Hefei to um, Fuzhou, but now they can only use four hours. It's just reduced to four hours. That's really amazing, right? And some people will just avoid using planes and especially choose to travel by this uh, uh, railway, uh, railway, just because uh, rail, because they want to enjoy the beautiful sceneries. So that is about uh, Hefei Fuzhou high speed line. And there's another line which is also remarkable. It is built on the roof of the world. Um, that is a railway from Qinghai to Tibet. Tibet. You know, because um, most of the lines, most of the railways were built uh, on permafrost frozen earth. And it is really high. It is the highest railway in the world. Um, for example, at the Tangula Pass, um, it is, the railway is um, 5,000. Uh, 72 meters above sea level. And along the line, like 19, uh, 960 kilometers is about 4,000 meters. So it is really technically challenging railway. And uh, altogether, it is it runs like 1,000, almost 2,000 kilometers. So can you imagine, right, to build such a long railway uh, in the third pole of the earth, right? So that is a really amazing, remarkable railways. And that enables people to travel to, you know, just every part of China, even Tibet, right? Even Lhasa, right? Um, and also like uh, they can just run through the mountain, right? So that is really amazing. So this great technology is also exported to other countries to benefit other countries to let them to enjoy the efficiency um, and the, the, the great speed right brought by Gautier. Uh, you can see this picture it is taken uh, in Turkey right so you can see this is the national flag of Turkey. So this is a high-speed rail line connecting Istanbul with Turkey's capital Ankara right and also there are projects in like uh, Saudi Arabia, Hungary and Serbia, Thailand and, and Indonesia right and it is said that um, a line is also built to connect China with Europe right so this is a trans asian network linking China with Europe and probably it will be completed by 20 30, right? And there's also high speed rail line in Russia linking Moscow to Kazan. And so these are all supported by the Chinese uh, uh, Gautier or high speed rail uh, tech technology. So we're really proud of it, right? Um, okay, so I think that's all for the uh, railways. Now let's come to the highway in China or the expressway, right? Um, well, say if you want to travel uh, by uh, driving your own cars, right? So you can take the highways. Um, so you can see from this map, map, there's really another big network, right, of the highways. It is just um, accessible, right, to every part of uh, China. So almost all cities, counties, and towns are accessible by highways. And the total length of it, Right, 150,000 kilometers. And there's a project called 11118 project. Um, sorry, 71118 project. Seven um, means that there were seven expressways starting from Beijing. And most of those uh, expressways or highways are major uh, e expressways uh, for China. For example, uh, from Beijing to Guangzhou, from Beijing to uh, Lhasa, right? From Beijing to Harbin, right? To the, to the north, to the south, to the southwest, etc. So uh, altogether, seven major uh, highways uh, starting from Beijing. And also there are 11 vertical expressways. Oh, uh, wow, this is so intensive, right? We cannot count already. And also 18 horizontal expressways, right? So many expressways. And uh, there are 20 provinces, altogether there are 33, right? 20 provinces of China have expressways of over 1,242 miles. So that's almost 2,000 kilometers. And some provinces, they have um, the largest, right, uh, mileage, right, uh, of the highway. For example, Guangdong uh, rank the top, uh, and the Hebei and the Henan province just um, followed, right, as the second and the third place. Um, so 
you know that in most of those uh, um, provinces, right, their uh, the highways really are well built, right. So it en enable people to travel to the places where they want to go, and for especially for some special regions, uh, for some clusters, original clusters, for example, like this area called Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei, we call it Jingjinji, right, uh, and also like Yangtze River Delta. Um, you can see this this area, well, Beijing, Tianjin, and the many uh, cities of Hebei are integrated. So the transportation uh, is greatly uh, developed, uh, so that uh, it will enable these uh, these uh, cities could cooperate uh, smoothly. So, for example, um, you can use this uh, Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei transportation card uh, in whatever places, right? In Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei. Right, so you can use this card to uh, take a trip in some buses in Beijing, Tianjin, and also cities of Hebei province. Um, and now let's look at this Yangtze River Delta area. It is very rich area, and so in order to um, help these places, uh, th these um, provinces to integrate, right? So more transportation systems were built up. For example, they uh, built up the uh, new airport and they also built up the expressway from uh, Hangzhou to Taizhou. And they also um, built up the high-speed rail line from Hangzhou to Wenzhou. Now, let me show you a video uh, which show us about um, the development of the Yangtze River Delta, especially the transportation here. Uh, uh, the development that really helped um, the integration uh, of, of this area. The Yangtze River Delta covers Shanghai and its three neighboring provinces of Jiangsu, Zhejiang, and Anhui. In 2022, the GDP of the region reached over 4 trillion US dollars, which ranked third among countries in the world. At the opening ceremony of the first China's International Import Expo, President Xi Jinping announced integrated development of the Yangtze River Delta as a national strategy. You know, this is the most advanced economy of China. You know, accounting for about a you know, quarter of Chinese economies. Uh, and the resources can be freely reallocated across the province and the city. One key word for the region's development is integration. It was first manifested in road and railway connections. Inter-provincial roads and bridges have been built. Now it only takes one to two hours to travel between key cities in the region by high-speed train. Environment and ecology have always been placed on the top of the agenda. And one problem that can be solved through integration is responsibility for environmental protection that's shared across regions. In a demonstration zone covering more than 2,000 square kilometers, the proportion of blue and green space should be no less than 66% by 2035. Green transportation will account for 80%. Because this is very important for the economy of China, you know. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, a company located in either Zhejiang or Shanghai. Any company actually can produce a very strong spillover effect for neighboring provinces of the city. This is China's big ambition for the Yangtze River Delta. China is building this region into a powerhouse that will drive the country's future development. Chen Ling, CGTN, Shanghai. Mm. Okay, so from this video show, you can see um, the integration, right, of the transportation or the development of the transportation really enable uh, this uh, regional cluster to develop even more quickly, right? Okay, I think that's all for the introduction about the intercity traveling, right? We talked about uh, like the, um, the airplane, the high-speed rail in China, and then also the highways, and also some transportation in regional clusters. Uh, I think that's all for the introduction uh, of uh, the intercity transportation and also intercity transportation. And if you are uh, you are interested in the topic and you have any questions, uh, we can um, we still have like uh, uh, twelve minutes left, right? We can uh, have a communication. We can talk about okay. this topic. Okay, thanks for Professor Liu's wonderful lecture. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, we have a few minutes left, like uh, <laughs> Professor Liu prepares very good uh, presentation and also very good pictures and videos for us. So it's longer than we expected. 
So uh, we, I think we only have five minutes for the questions. So uh, you can type your questions if you have any. And uh, by the time you are typing, maybe I can ask one question first, like really quick. Some of the students already asked that question during the lecture. Uh, they ask like a mobile payment, like uh, uh, WeChat Pay or Alipay, like is well uh, used like in China right now. But can foreigners use it? And if not, uh, can they pay by like cash or uh, international credit card for transportation? Well, there's a good news, right? So the credit card can be linked uh, with the uh, WeChat and Alipay, right? So there's the detailed, um, uh, you know, ways, right, for people to follow as long as you download the app and then follow the procedure and then you can uh, connect or link your credit card with the Alipay or uh, WeChat Pay. And then you will feel free, right, to use this kind of way of payment in China. Uh, I think that um, this is really a good news uh, for foreigners, uh, as long as you have prepared it ready and definitely you can use it here in China. Well, if you use cash, I think that for, um, for, for taxi, right, or if you buy tickets uh, uh, in the subway station or uh, for taxi, and also for the bus, well, I think that they are okay. Uh, but um, but do remember if you pay for the bus fare, um, there's no change. So you need to prepare the correct amount of money, right? Yeah. For like a two yuan, right? Otherwise, if <laughs> small you charges, the same, and there, yeah, there's no change, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. There's a uh, recent news like two days uh, earlier. Um, like uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay, uh, they announced they accept foreign cars, bank cars for payment. So you can try if you have WeChat or you can download Alipay from your app store and try linked with your uh, uh, bank card. I think they, uh, they accept Visa or MasterCard and, and, and many like common uh, cards, like bank cards, mm -hmm. you can use them. So next time we yeah, come actually, come to China, you can try. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, in China, really few people use cash, right? Probably only senior citizens. Some of the senior citizens who are uh, unable to use cell phones and they still stick to the old way of payment, right? Use cash. But otherwise, like people just use cell phone. As long as you take a cell phone with you, it seems that everything can be solved. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any other questions uh, you want to discuss with Professor Liu? You know? <laughs> oh, um, let me see. I'm on the train, go provide the hot water to boy instant noodle. Oh, yeah, there's the hot water. Um, but I guess a instant noodle. Yes, you can use the hot water, right, uh, to make your own uh, boiled instant noodle, right? Um, but actually, few people tend to really eat in the carriage of the uh, of uh, dao tie, right? Um, they usually will dine in the dine um, cafeteria carriage, right? But but still, you can use the hot water, right? There is hot water. Mm. Yeah, I believe they have. All right, so yeah, if you don't have any other questions, um, then maybe let's take a picture together. <laughs>